Um, so without any further ado, I would like to introduce tonight's speaker because I'm oh so excited um, to welcome her to LACP, Dr. Lindy Lettinen, who is responsible for the Huntington Library's vast photography collection, which means that on a daily basis, she gets to play with over 80,000 images, which is a staggering amount of, of um, photographs and collections, and we will talk about that tonight. Um, she received her BA in art history from the University of Chicago and her PhD from uh, the University of Wisconsin Medicine. Um, she has also worked for several museums, um, including the Getty and the Skirball Cultural Center right here in LA and the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, where she co-curated the exhibition, The Train RFK's Last Journey. Her research focuses um, on Asian and Asian American photography, especially from the Philippines and its diaspora. And I, um, I think we're gonna get to hear a little bit about that tonight as well. Um, she published numerous essays and articles and she presents regularly on diverse topics around the histories um, of photography and the photo book to decolonizing practices in photography. Her work is um, crucial for where we are now in the world of photography and contemporary art and visual storytelling and beyond. So I'm so excited to welcome her tonight. Lindy, thank you for being with us. Uh, thanks to the Los Angeles Center of Photography for this invitation. And also thanks to everyone working behind the scenes to make this thank happen. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I just a quick housekeeping note. Um, we are going to hear from Lindy and as she um, presents her work and talks about projects um, and ideas, feel free to drop your questions in the chat and we will take them at the end of the presentation. Um, so thank you, Lindy, go right ahead. So I thought, it, again, I really appreciate the invitation to, to talk with you all. I've actually been at the Huntington only since last September. So I'm still learning quite a bit about uh, how things go there and it's been a whirlwind, a wonderful whirlwind. Um, I thought I'd take tonight to talk just in general about my role as a photography curator, um, how I work with photographers and collections, um, also discuss some past projects that I've curated, um, and discuss overall my engagement with photography in so many ways through research, archives, artists, and communities, and how I see the medium moving forward in the future, especially through a collection like the Huntington's. Um, and just a very small correction, um, Rotem, there's actually um, 1 million photographs in the collection that I have to play with. So it says 800,000 on the website, but it's definitely over that. So um, I have my work cut out for me and, I, and I'm here for it. Um, but first, before the hunting, can, um, before I get into the hunting stuff, I wanted to give you just a little bit of my background um, and experiences before that. Um, I received a lot of my training um, in photography and archives when I worked at the the Getty, both the museum and the Getty Research Institute. Um, I worked there for about between those two places for about five years. And when I was at the Research Institute, I worked in collection development, but I also was able to conduct dissertation research on the photographer, uh, Paul Outerbridge, an American photographer who worked between the 1920s and 50s, primarily um, on that line between both fine art and commercial photography. And you can see here, um, you know, I've always been interested in the circulation of photography, especially on the printed page. And these are just some examples of his archive at the Getty Research Institute that I worked with. And you can see that I found a lot of his um, preparatory drawings um, for photographs that he later took and then published in magazines like Vanity Fair um, or House Beautiful magazine later on in the, in the late 30s. He was a big um, proponent and a big um, practitioner of the Tricolor Carbo. Uh, process, which is a very um, rigorous process that was used very often in advertising for its deeply saturated colors and the way that it translated on the page. And so I became really fascinated with that and um, be able, was able to write my dissertation on him. Um, after the after my time at the Getty, I worked at the Skirball Cultural Center as assistant curator. And one of the really honestly transformative projects I was had the privilege to work on there was a managing curator for an exhibition about Manzanar, the Japanese American incarceration camp, um, as photographed in this case um, by Ansel Adams. Um, that was the, the main part of the exhibition. 
This is actually me visiting the Manzanar National Historic Site back in 2015, because I felt like I couldn't actually work on the show unless I was there and actually understood what the conditions were like, what the wind felt like, what the dust felt like, um, what it was to feel the harsh environment, um, and even just a sliver, a, a glimpse of what it was to actually be part of that and be um, put under that um, was really um, overwhelming and also important as I tried to um, really make the show for this girl. Um, I wanted to give voice to a lot of the portraits that were taken by Anne Ferrara. Um, these are just some examples that were in the show because I really wanted to understand, you know, beyond just Ansel Adams going to this camp and taking photographs of the people, um, what, what else was going on here? I, I consulted archives at UCLA and the Bancroft li Library, as well as found several oral histories, just to give more dimension and, and narrative to the photograph. Um, and as you can see, I actually, in the exhibition, we um, featured pamphlets and other ephemera from the camp, as well as um, monitors where you had oral histories playing next to the corresponding photograph. So you see the little girl there in the back, that's the, the little girls all grown up in the, um, in the oral history that we have on the video. And so it really was about activating these photographs in a new way and, and through a, you know, a lot more historical dimension. I also expanded the exhibition somewhat to incorporate works by other photographers, such as Toyo Miyatake, who was himself incarcerated in the camp. And um, I'm not sure how many people are aware of this, but he had secretly built a camera to take with him and to take photographs, um, even though it was forbidden to do so. Eventually, though, that restriction was lifted and then Miyatake was a uh, designated official camp photographer where he was able to freely take photos of Manzanar life in everyday life, um, but also more pointed pictures like the one on the right. I also was able to include Dorothea Lang's work in this exhibition whose photographs at the time were actually marked with the word impounded. If you look closely at these, you can see the scrawling on the bottom um, where someone wrote that basically censoring them um, because they were too revealing about the conditions of the camp. And so for me, this is where I'm coming from is that my perspective is very much thinking about the photograph as an object um, and all of the context that comes with it, including writing, um, it's essential to telling the full story. So in this case, I made sure that the photographs were shown not over matted, but completely um, really laid bare to see how these were um, not only taken, but also how they were then um, uh, circulated and pressed upon and, and judged, essentially. So now I just want to move on a little bit more to some of my experience working with artists and, and archives. Um, I think this is really a key strategy in how we can start to reimagine um, many existing photographic collections. The way that artists can intervene with a collection um, and with institutional space is extremely powerful. Um, and I've experienced it through um, these, some of these incredible artists that I'm gonna mention. Um, I, in my previous role as assistant uh, curator of photography at SF MoMA, I worked with Berkeley-based artist Kenyatta A.C. Hinkle, who you see on the left, um, who located West African ethnographic images from carte de visite and postcards um, and then she enlarges them and applies collage, glitter, paint, and other materials, even clippings from old National Geographic magazines, um, which are charged uh, objects and materials in and of themselves, to really enact this, what she calls a reversal of the colonial gaze on Black bodies. Um, it was very eye-opening to work with her and um, see her vision um, throughout this process and throughout this transformation, really, of imagery. Um, this is just another example where you see the original postcards um, that she's drawing from and then what she's reimagined on the right. I also worked with an artist named Irina Alejo, an emerging artist who um, is based in San Francisco. Uh, you see uh, Irina here on the left during an installation at SF MoMA from earlier in 2021. Um, Irina explores labor displacement and family, as well as communal history in their work. Um, Arena is a third generation renter who grew up in different parts of San Francisco, um, in the Mission, in the Excelsior districts, and witnessed a lot of the changes as a result of gentrification. So when, when SF MoMA wanted to commission some artists, especially during the pandemic, Arena's work began to emerge for me as someone, you know, we, we wanted to talk to, we wanted to be able to work with and develop an idea. And so 
for the commission, Arena developed a, a series of photographs that um, were part of a series called My Ancestors Followed Me Here. And Arena examined a lot of the textures and landmarks and activities, as well as people along Mission Street and how they were affected by the pandemic. Um, on the right is just an example of one person of, out of many that Arena uh, interviewed, uh, took photographs of, um, spent time with. I mean, this is how Arena works. A lot of it is about grassroots organizing, activism, um, as well as photography, but it's a, it's a really deep kind of um, connection with the community. Um, and in this case, the woman on the right is Tita Tess, um, who owns a restaurant um, in the mission. Um, Tita is, is, is the word uh, in Tagalog for aunt, so it's an affectionate term. It's also, you know, a family term. Um, and so uh, Tita Tess runs this restaurant, but she was able to talk to Arena about the struggles she's had to survive in, in the United States as an immigrant. And so what was great about this working with this project is that um, Arena, because of how powerful and how dedicated they were to these people, to their neighborhood, um, they interviewed um, a, a lot of them, and a lot of them did not speak English, so they worked with different um, translators. And so by the time we had the exhibition, a lot of the excerpts of original interviews were in English, Spanish, and Tagalog on the labels, which was really important and meaningful um, for the whole presentation. Um, one of the biggest projects I worked on and co-curated with Clément Cheru at SF Mama was called The Train, RFK's Last Journey. And this again was a really transformative project for me to work on. It was, it focused on this historical moment in 1968 when Robert Kennedy's funeral train made its way from, after he had been tragically assassinated, made its way from New York to Washington, DC. Um, we showed three different views of this one historical day. And on the left, you see um, Paul Fusco's um, interpretation of it. He was a photojournalist that was on the train and he was taking photographs of mourners who had decided to come out and mourn and watch the train go through their town. And then in the middle, you see a, a photograph that was taken by someone who was along the, tr the railroad tracks taking pictures of the train. Um, so that's a different point of view and perspective. And on the right, you see a third point of view, which was a, a contemporary work made by Philippe Perrineau, who made a recreation and a film of this day in 1968 using some historical um, uh, materials and recreating them in a new form. For the purpose of tonight, I wanted to talk about the vernacular photographs that we, we inclu included in the exhibition. These were collected by a contemporary photographer um, and a Dutch artist named Ryan Mjola Terpstra. And he had been aware of this event, even though he lived in, in Amsterdam, he knew about this event, was fascinated by it, realized when he was looking at historical photos, how many people he saw were holding cameras. And he said, where are those photographs? Where do those photographs exist? Why haven't I seen those? And he began searching for them. Well, where do you search for photographs like this? Here's one example um, from Island, New Jersey. Another example from Tullytown, Pennsylvania. These are, um, these are slides and then you can even see some of the person wrote waiting, waiting and watching for the train, here it comes. So these wonderful uh, captions, where did he find them? Facebook. Um, he found that the easiest way he could do to, to do this was to join local community Facebook book groups and start making queries about who was there that day along the railroad tracks. He was able to basically get these photographs through working with this active online community, gaining trust and forming an archive that way. So these are just some screenshots of the exchanges, just to give you an example. And that's Ryan on the left with one of the uh, people that were there that day. Um, I learned so much about how photography can function in this way, in one's memory, um, in, a, in a family album. Here's an example of a family album that was also um, found through Facebook and how it can easily be retrieved and given new meaning. Um, this is the installation shot that we have in the, in the exhibition. These are the actual photos that Ryan collected and positioned according to where they were taken along the path of the train. Um, so SF Mama subsequently acquired this entire work and then wrote letters to each of the family members who donated their photograph to the project, um, offering them free admission to the museum and then again developing uh, connections along that way. So it was really, um, again, powerful as well as meaningful project that had to do with many different dimensions of photography. So 
the past projects and exhibitions that I've worked on have really prepared me for my current role as curative photography at the Huntington Library, which is what I'm going to talk about, which is the main part of what we're going to talk about for the rest of this presentation. The Huntington is a, a, in a really unique position. Um, it's a collection-based research and educational institution. Um, and I often describe it as a hybrid place. It's a library, it's a museum, it's a botanical garden. Um, there's nothing really like it anywhere else. And photography intersects with each of these components in significant ways. I am so lucky to be the photography curator at this place. Um, for those who aren't familiar with how the Huntington began, um, Henry Huntington and his uncle Collis Huntington were leaders in building the railroads um, that spanned the country. And in 1902, um, two years after the death of Collis, um, Henry transferred his headquarters to Los Angeles um, from the East Coast and bought the San Marino Ranch, which is now the Huntington. Um, he married Arabella Huntington, who happened to be the widow of Collis um, in 1913, a little bit of a scandal, but that's okay. Um, together, they amassed an extensive library, art, and botanical um, collection that, as you can see and as you will see, continues to evolve. Um, so I thought I'd start with this image um, that I found in the Huntington's collection when I was first um, exploring what, what was here. Um, it features a group of women standing in front of what is captioned as Pasadena's first photograph gallery. I looked it up and it was called the Ferndale Gallery, opened by George Weingarth in 1882. Uh, the women are some of his family members, it turns out. And they're posed in front, in front of the striking structure. The windows are open, pictures are hang, hung outside for display. Um, you see tree saplings planted in this barren ground around the building. And just for me, it signifies a convergence of many things um, that are of interest to me. It's, it's the beginning of something new, um, a new medium, a new space and a territory. Um, it's about the display of photography. It centers women. Um, it's embedded within the California landscape. I just, I felt connected to this photograph immediately. And it seemed a, a good um, starting point for this talk as well. And incidentally, it comes from the C.C. Pierce collection which was the first um, set of, uh, which was the first major collection of photographs to enter the Huntington collection. So that's also, um, again, quite fitting. So since I started at the Huntington in September of last year, I've been delving into this exceptional group of, of photographs. Again, like I said, it's, it's about a million photographs. And I wanted to share with you just the slice of what I've learned so far about the scope of it, um, some of the discoveries I've made, um, as well as some recent acquisitions that I wanted to share with you. Um, I want to use the collection really to tell many different histories of photography, and I'm just beginning my journey. There is just so much potential. Um, the Huntington's collection comprises photographs dating from the 1850s to the present. A lot of people ask me when I started this job, they said, oh, is it only early photography? No, we collect contemporary as well. Um, and overall, it includes a wide variety of print and negative processes and formats. And yes, our strengths are, do include photography of California, and the American West primarily, but we do have a lot of other material as well, which you'll see. Most of the holdings feature historical, documentary, and commercial photography, and then we also have fine art photographs from a range of periods. Um, part of the stories of these photographs, um, it's, it's who cares for them over time and how they've become accessible and where they live now within the archives. So I thought I'd show you where they live. Um, on the left is the view of where most of the photographs are stored. Um, and then we also have a physical card catalog, which is something of a relic. It hasn't been added to since the mid nineties, but um, we do consult it still to find certain things um, deep, deep down in the archives, um, as well as search uh, within the online library catalog. But I just wanted to do you see some of the, um, some of the ways that we actually store our photographs. And then this is me on the left. And I think my first few weeks there peering into a daguerreotype <laughs> Um, of Lyman Beecher, who was the father of Harriet Beecher Stowe, the author of Uncle Tom's Cabin, incidentally. Um, and as you know, the daguerreotype is, is the earliest form of photography, um, often called a mirror with a memory. Um, to reference the fact, of course, as you see, when you look at it, you can see a reflection on the surface. And it's just, again, it's, I can't get over it. It's so magical to me every time. I still, I still just can't. It's, it's something that really moves me when I look at a daguerreotype and when I try to like move a daguerreotype and, and work with it. I had a class of nine to 13 year olds that wanted to learn about the history of photography 
in a show and tell. And I, many of them had never seen daguerreotypes before, or even knew what a daguerreotype was. And again, in this age of screen, you know, screen shares and and iPads um, and touchscreens, and they were enthralled and amazed and kept asking me, "How do you spell it again?" So I can look up, look it up more. So there is hope. There is hope for the for the next generation. They were just as interested in daguerreotypes um, as they were in, in the iPhones. Um, one thing that's interesting is when we research objects like this, um, we do things like, of course, look into provenance and find out where it came from, when it came to the library and how. And you'll see in, in this card, um, which again, from the, that card catalog, um, it reveals a lot of information. Um, we got it in 1939 from Friends of the Library, which was an early donor group, um, for all of $35. Um, we have a broad range of, of, of case objects, actually, in our collection that all have cards similar to this. Um, and it just, it tells me another layer of this object's history, which I think is, again, it continues to unfold. Um, we have a lot of also amber types and tin types um, in the collection, as well as daguerreotypes. And even fun little finds like this, um, uh, this is just a gem of a, of a, of a little album. It's probably the smallest item in our collection that I can tell so far. Um, when you actually look inside it, um, it's a lovely little family album of tin types. And it's just little little flashes like that. You can see also um, they've written in the individual family members. Um, it's just, it's moments like that that just make me feel so much more connected to the medium and so much more connected to the history of how it really began. Um, <clears throat> So I also thought I'd show you some other examples of photography in the collection, such as these vivid autochromes. Um, you might recognize the one on the left, which has been used as the kind of um, key image for this talk tonight. Um, and these are autochromes, which some of you may or may not know, they're po basically positive transparencies on these glass supports that are made of um, uh, very tiny uh, grains of potato chips that have dye in them. And um, the ones I'm showing you here are, are from early days at the Huntington in the 1920s, um, the stunning views of the Desert Garden. And then on the right is um, a luminous Anna Hyatt Huntington, who was a sculptor and also the second wife of Archer Huntington, who was Arabella's uh, son. The family, the Huntington family line is, is very intricate. I'm still kind of learning it, but when I saw this um, autochrome, it also took my breath away. Um, other histories of photography, other forms of photography um, that speak to early parts of an early moment of California. I would say like these stereographs, a, a vast stereograph collection. Um, and here's one of a bucolic Pasadena on the left by Carlson Watkins. And then on the right is uh, one of the railroad by Alfred Hart. Um, he was the official photographer of the Central Pacific Railroad and spent years documenting its construction between 1864 and 1869. Um, so much so that they would even um, allow him to stop trains and work crews for the time needed to set up his camera and make photographs. So kind of a big deal. Um, they both tell stories of an early Los Angeles, the landscape, as well as the industry and infrastructure of the railroads, and how it really turned from a more rural space to the metropolis that we know today. The Huntington is also one of the world's great repositories for the work of Carlton Watkins. Um, a boyhood friend of Collis Huntington, which is how we have a lot of the work here already. Um, and Watkins made over 1,300 mammoth plate um, pictures, such as the one you see here of Yosemite Falls, and thousands more stereographs and smaller format pictures. And the Huntington has continued to add to its holdings, um, and we now own more than 1,000 Watkins photographs. Um, one of the signature photographs of this collection is this one of, of all things, peaches. Um, as just as famous and as compelling as the Yosemite shots or Mount Shasta, this late George Kling Peaches is just, it's in my mind and in many, others, uh, mind, many other minds, a masterpiece. Um, it's from an album illustrating the agricultural industry of Kern County. I put the cover on the left so you see, again, context in which these photographs are, are actually housed and, and shown. Um, and they were made uh, by Watkins on multiple trips between um, the, basically during the 1880s. Um, the peaches are packed really tightly in, this, in these four rows in such a way that uh, Watkins scholar Tyler Green has said one of my most favorite quotes about this. Um, he's described these as baby bottoms in a box. Love it. Just spot on. Um, it's a photograph that uses so detailed 
so lush, disorienting, absolutely absorbing. It has everything for me. And I'm so pleased it's in our collection. Um, it's so hard to tell even like how he took it, which angle he took it. Did he take it from above? Did he, um, did he take it from the front? It's again, it's that is also part of the disorientation. We do know also um, from Tyler Green that he the pizzas were shipped to his studio in San Francisco where he actually composed this. So that's another interesting detail about this um, and how it was made. That's something I didn't know and that I've, I've learned about this really um, now iconic image. Now I'm looking at figures like Watkins. I wanna also consider how contemporary works and activations could be in dialogue with these photographs. Um, the enemy is born Vin Don, whose work you see on the right, explores themes of landscape and memory, often using older photographic processes like daguerreotypes. He also works with um, indigenous botanicals, which is interesting to me. Um, he became fascinated with national landmarks through works, by seeing works by Watkins and, and Ansel Adams and things like that. Um, but in his mind, he wants to think about how it relates to a nation of immigrants. And, you know, I put that next to Watkins because I think this is a really interesting way to reread or, or rethink our notion of California landscape and what that means. Um, we don't have Ben Don's work yet in our collection, but it's, it is someone I'm interested in talking more with. So this is just an example of how I'm, I'm thinking about um, different um, engagements and different connections between historical and, and contemporary work. Another area of the collection that I'm working with um, more are the Native American photographs that we have, which are throughout different parts of our collection. Um, it's a very complex history, of course, um, because of questions of agency and power made visible through many of the images taken mostly by non-Native people, such as Edward Curtis, Frederick Monson, and Carl Moon. Um, photographs such as this on the left with the arrows um, in the cactus or the stunning portrait on the right um, could be interpreted in numerous ways. Uh, for me, I see resistance and resilience. Uh, there's tension and strangeness, connection and promise. I, I see a lot of these things going on and circulating, but there's definitely more to discover and more to figure out. Um, other examples that we have here, this is a photograph uh, made by A. Frank Randall, a studio photographer of a female Native American scout, um, rifle in hand. Um, she apparently was riding along with US soldiers and was part of a campaign to capture the Apache peoples in Mexico who had fled um, their um, confinement, but we don't know for sure. These are still speculations, but again, we're learning about what we have and what we can do to research these histories and discover some of the stronger voices here. Um, this particular photograph is part of an album um, that is just one example of the rich holdings that we have of Native American photographs within the wider collection. And um, several years ago, an assessment and, and a cataloging project of these collections um, took place at the Huntington. And you can actually access uh, a number of thousands of these from the Huntington Digital Library, just putting a screen cap for, to show you an example um, that you can get to through our website. I'm working now with my colleagues um, in other parts of the collection, our Hispanic and California collections, as well as our Western history collections, um, to do a deeper dive into what we have in the review both our Native American and Indigenous photographs and archives and develop recommendations for the future for working with various tribes and representatives to help us interpret these collections even more. Um, and so these are next steps that we're definitely taking and trying to work um, very collaboratively on. Some examples of contemporary Indigenous artists that we have recently added to the collection, in this case, the Huntington Museum collection, um, are works by uh, Mercedes Dorme and, and Cara Romero. Um, these are actually on view now in an exhibition called Borderlands. Um, Mercedes um, Dorme on the left draws on a lot of the traditions and ceremonial practices of her Tongva ancestry in order to reclaim a lot of the narratives and even um, relationships to, to landscape. And on the right, um, Cara Romero um, is, is a, uh, a citizen of the um, Chimacuebi Indian tribe in the Mojave Desert. Um, and this is titled Hermosa because um, she took her daughter um, on a shoot, their other series um, of photographs that include her daughter to the shore of Hermosa Beach in Los Angeles as a way to represent um, the creation stories of, um, of her um, tribe and the songs and myths related to it. Um, so my next steps, for example, would be to have artists such as this come to the photography collection in the library and start to generate dialogues um, that way, 
with our historical materials and have them look through what we have and just begin to, to sift through and, and, and make sense of it together. Um, so an ongoing process. And again, I'm incredibly um, devoted to that. So shifting gears a little bit, just speaking of historical materials, another part of our collection um, that I, again, I realized we had a lot of strength in is, is material in the American Civil War. Um, we have a lot of material by George Bernard, Barnard, Andrew Russell, Matthew Brady, um, Timothy O'Sullivan, and Alexander Gardner. Um, this is a rather grisly photograph um, taken at the Battle of Gettysburg, um, also known as the Harvest of Death. That's a very iconic, uh, well-known Civil War landscape um, of the aftermath of battle taken by Timothy O'Sullivan and then printed by Gardner. But what's interesting, what I love about the Hendrickson's collection and how it just keeps giving, um, as I was looking through the rest of the collection and, and trying to find um, connections between this and other things, I realized that we also have a stereograph of the same scene. But then when I actually looked a little bit closer, the images are actually two views of the same scene, but taken from opposite sides of the battlefield. And the one on the right is from a stereograph collection that we have, and the one on the left is from a, a, a completely different um, collection. So again, bringing these together in a way, it was important. But then when I actually looked even more into it, Alexander Gardner wrote narratives to accompany these photographs in a book called The Photographic Sketchbook of the War. And what's fascinating is that the same men that presented from one angle um, in, the, in the sketchbook of the war are described by the photographer's confederates. And then he used the other image um, just from a different angle and called them Union soldiers. So the staging of photographs, as we know, and manipulating the truth of, of a photograph, of course, we understand that that has been part of it since the beginning. Um, and it happened quite a bit. But I think what's so great is we have an example of both views in our collections so we can trace this so clearly. That's, this is just the photo you're in, I guess. Oh, there's the, the caption for it. Um, we also have numerous examples of portraiture that speak to different historical moments, um, as well as sociology, ethnography, popular culture. This is a fun and strange and maybe slightly unsettling um, photography game. Um, it's a card game called Fizzogs, a British game from the 1940s, which popularizes the art of judging human character through facial features. Um, it's based on a sociologist's idea of how to judge character from the face. And it has these printed cards, the key book describing facial character types, and then you can manipulate them and swap them out. <laughs> it's both disturbing, especially in the context of when this was made, um, right at the, not, at the height of Nazi racial ideology, um, as well as though strange, quirky, and even maybe a little whimsical in the pseudoscience. And these are things I'm interested in. I like a lot of things like, you know, um, thinking about the face phrenology, mug shots, um, those forms of photography really interest me and in how they're used for surveillance and, um, and um, other, you know, political reasons too. But it, those are the these are types of things that interest me about um, this type of portraiture. And I hope to collect more interesting things like this too. Another um, aha moment, I couldn't believe we had this, but we had a whole, uh, a whole, collection of Francis Benjamin Johnston. Um, and she made her name as a photographer in the 1890s and is commonly considered the first female photojournalist. Her career spanned six decades and she operated her own studio taking portraits of the political elite in Washington, DC. Um, this is of Susan B. Anthony, for example. Um, the Huntington has over 1,200 of her prints and corresponding glass plate negatives, um, which were purchased by Henry Huntington from her in 1924. Um, so I'm still making my way through that collection, but it's it's remarkable. Um, and uh, Frances Benjamin Johnston, one of my favorite things she said, she published an article in the Ladies Home Journal um, in 1897, urging women to consider photography as a means of supporting themselves. I'm living it, so I really I really appreciate her work. Um, and it's a very powerful statement for the time. Um, her portraits of women's rights activists, um, like like Susan B. Anthony. Um, capture the spirit of coming together, different groups working toward women's suffrage. Um, and as you can see, this is a cyanotype print, which really was used by many photographers at this time as a work print. You know, it was a way to, as a ready reference, um, to check exposure and decide on cropping for the final print. But in this case, I just love how the blue gives it this 
ghostly, um, otherworldly quality that somehow makes it more compelling. So I still have a lot to discover of her work. Um, I've also been doing a lot of research on materials related to the history of the Philippines um, and the Filipino American experience um, in our collection. This, um, as, as Rita mentioned in the introduction, is a very strong interest of mine. Um, but based in part, yes, on my, on my my own heritage, my own Filipino heritage, um, but also this is an area of research and scholarship that really hasn't been um, worked through enough when it comes to the history of the Philippines and history of photography and where those two things intersect. We already have an amazing um, foundation of historical materials for our Pacific Rim collections, and I want to continue building off of that through photography. Um, some of the portraits that I've already found um, are albums such as this one from the 1940s, um, taken after World War II, which to me, you know, 85 years of Filipino life. I mean, I just, it speaks to, of such pride and strength. Um, but there are, of course, other parts of our collection um, that are much darker and tell very complex histories of colonialism, both under Spanish and American rule. Um, I've been looking for more work um, to add to the collection in this area, and I did find that an incredible um, collection of, of real photo postcards that I just acquired for the uh, collection. It hasn't even been processed yet, so you're looking at kind of loose shots here. Um, but there are almost 800 of these um, that we were able to get. And this is just a sampling, but it spans the years of transition from the end of the Spanish colonial government through the decades of American administration. And many were sent to the mail, to destinations like Hong Kong, San Francisco, Honolulu, um, as well as Los Angeles. Um, they have handwritten inscriptions on some. Um, messages, stamps indicating how they were viewed. Some of them are hand colored, as you can see, really captivating um, imagery. And then there's also ways that we can trace um, the studios that were working in Manila or other parts of the Philippines um, at this time, which is a really important way that I'm also trying to do to conduct research and understand who was working, who was making photographs, and who was um, posing for photographs, and, and what were the conditions like there. So this is going to be, I think, a really um, incredible resource, not only for myself, but hopefully for other research researchers who come through to the Huntington um, as we as we get this uh, collection process. And so these are just a couple of examples of some studio portraits as well. Um, so I had the opportunity before I started the Huntington and, and closer to the beginning of the pandemic to lead an online workshop um, on the topic of decolonizing photography. Now, this means many different things to different people, and I completely understand, and to many different institutions, it means a lot of things. For me, uh, decolonizing can be defined, I think, as destabilizing, um, refusing, uh, restructuring um, of different histories of photography. And this image, which is not in the Huntington's collection, but it's at the Hispanic Society's collection, which is in New York, and which we are closely affiliated with, um, is from a set of photograph albums taken in the 1870s, and it features um, a woman who is known now to us as a mestiza descendant. Um, this is a woman of mixed Chinese and Philippine ancestry. And this is someone that um, I've come to know in a way through um, my research on the Philippines and photography. Um, she's, I mean, to say it bluntly, she's kind of the Mona Lisa for the, for the Filipino community. Um, it was taken by the Dutch photographer Francisco Van Camp, um, who owned a studio in Manila. And it just has this remarkable presence um, that's made it iconic and, and really an anchor for a lot of my ongoing research. Um, so I've also been talking with artists such as Filipina American um, artist Sethi Filippo, who um, these are some examples of her work. She performed research at the Smithsonian um, and as well as in St. Louis, um, which resulted in these really compelling projects that explore the problematic construction of American history. Um, and the colonization of the Philippines. Um, the works such as the one on the left, um, Blocked Out the Sun, um, you can see the artist's hands as they shield, care for and protect um, the photographed persons by covering up their faces in what I consider a very tender, tender gesture. Then on the right, you see a project called After Images, um, where she takes ethnographic images and makes them into photogravures, but then she crumples them and distorts it inevitably. So these are just some, some things that I've been thinking about, some constellations I'm putting together, both based on what we have um, historically in the collection and I'm trying to build in the collection, but also where I'm trying to take it. Um, and it's still in the early stages, but I'm excited to see how it will progress. So I guess I feel like it's, 
maybe it's required or something <laughs> to have a Hensel Adams in your PowerPoint if you're giving any, anything about history of photography. Um, everyone knows, uh, I mean, I assume everyone knows who Hensel Adams is. I'm not going to give an introduction. I mean, known for his views of the American West, of course, and, um, and landscape photography, the zone system, all of that. And I'm not trying to um, belittle it. It's just, you know, it's one of those things where you have, we have a lot of work by Hensel Adams. We have several of his portfolios. Um, we have this work. And it is something that is a, is a big part of our collection, which we really want to look at and, and examine. What I think I love about our collection is that we can examine a photograph like this in different ways. Um, so as I was looking around, it turns out that we have this great Hills Brothers coffee can, um, which Absol Adams, I guess, collaborated with the coffee company to make this wraparound image of his winter morning in Yosemite Valley, California photograph. Um, and the coffee cans were made in 1969. Um, and I think what's so fun is that we have this, first of all. And then um, it, it, another side note that I learned is that um, not everybody within the Adam Adams circle appreciated that he did this. Imogene Cunningham apparently um, expressed her judgment of this by sending Adams um, one of these cans, but emptied of the coffee and filled with soil um, with a live marijuana plant in it. I, this is just the story I've heard. Um, but, so things like this, I think, really enliven and and activate and kind of like and kind of make us think about Ansel Adams a little differently, which I enjoy. Um, other examples in our collection of a more satirical view of fine art photography are things like this: the Mike Mandel um, collection of portraits of photographers as baseball players with their stack on the back. So these are just some examples of the front and back of um, a, a selection of a whole 134 of them total of these baseball photography uh, trading cards. He traveled around the United States with baseball equipment, uniforms, <laughs> uh, a camera, and uh, produced this series of, of portraits. They're not only of photographers, but they're curators, art historians, and critics. Um, he had this set of cards that packaged in random groups of 10 when he when he printed them with bubble gum included, just like when you got on your top of the baseball card back in the day. Um, and the only way you could get a complete set was to make a trade. Well, the Huntington has a complete set, which is very exciting. And I really want to do more with it. I, I did something with it when I was at the moment. I'd love to um, think about how we can work with this um, at the Huntington as well. And this just this series always brings me joy. Um, and you know, to learn even now, these are all very collectible, of course, and especially the signed ones. And we do have a signed Ansel Adams one, which is also very exciting. This is just a detail of that, as well as Ansel Adams stats. Note that his favorite photographer, you see F P H on the upper right is Daguerre, which I can get behind that. Um, so we have a lot of contemporary work also made by photographers who've been informed by different narratives of California and the West. And so I did want to emphasize this as well. Um, th this is just one example, American photographer, um, John Humble, um, who moved to Los Angeles in 1974 and photographed the urban landscape um, from San Fernando Valley in East LA to Venice and Long Beach, um, here is Spoiled Heights, for example. And you just see how he captures and somehow finds these wonderful incongruities and ironies of Los Angeles, this 87 cent more or less store, <laughs> which I've never seen anything like that. Um, and this flurry of signage on the street, the woman um, walking just right at the, at the right moment um, across, the, across those um, display windows. Um, so, you know, it's great to have works like this, as well as the work on the right, which he was able to give us a, a book dummy that he made more of more street scenes and the houses and buildings in Los Angeles, um, which are just a whole other document of Los Angeles. And we're, we're really happy to have that as well. Um, here's a photographic series by LA based, um, Los uh, LA based artist Katie Shapiro um, that looks at a really interesting um, question of public and private space. Um, this is uh, the Broad Beach in Mountain View, California, um, and it's an exclusive area where these homeowners have erected these sandbags in front of their properties, claiming that they're putting them up, you know, to prevent erosion. But it's really a way to keep the public out and to just eat up more beachfront property. Um, so, and even the one on the right looks like this big whale taking over the beach. Um, I just think things like this are so important to be able to collect as this draws out tensions. Um, between both public and private space in, in California. So um, another aspect of my job is definitely studio visits. Um, this is a really big part of my 
my time and my um, commitment to, to, to the advancement of photography and to the thinking about photography, um, it's so important to spend time in these spaces um, to see work in progress, no matter how messy, um, to think about how works are being hung together in the space um, that the artist is, is inhabiting and spending so much time in. I've learned so much just from sitting and with artists um, to talk about their projects and materials and visions. Um, it's, and this is just a sampling of some of the visits I've made um, with Mercedes Dorme, the Mark Rudell, Kate Shapiro, whose work I just showed you. Um, I've also um, visited with Connie Samaris, um, David Horvitz, there he's been on experimental gardens that he has put together. <laughs> Um, and Guzmano um, Cesaretti, who actually worked at the Huntington many years ago as one of the, one of the staff photographers. Um, I also visited Bill Chang. We had a lovely visit, um, which was marked by um, the fading of this unfixed photograph on the left. Um, by the end of our visit, on the right, um, it had gone to black brown, which was just really, I mean, it's an intentional um, gesture and an intentional work. Um, and it was just very, very poetic in many ways um, to mark our time together. Um, I've also had people come to the Huntington to show me portfolios of work. Um, uh, Daniel um, Prosser came um, and Ellen O'Hara Slavic came to show me some recent work. Um, and then I traveled, I went to San Diego and happened to see Andrea Chung, Chung's work there um, and these, these wonderful cyanotypes that she's been making. Again, thinking about um, other processes and earlier processes that have been used and how contemporary artistry are reusing them. So I'm closing a little bit with um, two acquisitions that I recently put together and um, really I feel very close to, and I thought this was um, can kind of help you also understand how I'm kind of thinking of moving forward. Um, I thought I'd highlight these two because I, they can say a lot about the vision I have for the collection and a clear historical approach um, for collecting and interpreting photography. Um, these are two important yet often under-recognized female photographers from different eras and geographies who are each in dialogue with the Huntington's collection in perfect ways. Um, Anna Atkins on the left and Laura Aguilar on the right. Atkins corresponds directly with our botanical and British collections. Um, and Laura Aguilar connects to our extensive holdings of photography related to the California landscape, as well as our Hispanic in California. Um, materials and manuscripts. Um, 19th century uh, photographer and botanist, uh, I'm sure you know Anna Atkins, um, she actually learned cyanotype printing from Sir John Herschel, and she made her first book of botanical specimens um, in um, 1843, which is considered to be the first, really the first photographically um, illustrated book um, of cyanotypes. And, you know, again, she's, when I looked through the collection, I didn't see that we already had one. I was a little surprised, so I started looking, and I was so pleased when we were able to find a single cyanotype, um, which was originally part of an album that, which had subsequently been um, taken out, of, you know, decades before. Um, and this was dedicated to her childhood friend Anne Dixon, um, and it really demonstrates a little looser kind of visual freedom um, and experimentation. I think part of it has to do with the shape of the plant. It's an arrowhead uh, plant, um, which has leaves that resemble these arrow points. And it actually grows in, um, it's an aquatic plant that grows in, in lakes or ponds or streams. And I know this because I was able to talk to my colleagues in the botanical department. I went to our herbarium, we have an herbarium, and I looked at dead specimens and did comparisons and, and asked them if they could help me with the research. So I have that resource at this unique place. And it's really, it's really remarkable when you think about it. Um, we talked about even trying to grow this plant <laughs> at the Huntington, but we realized it's actually that when, when more research was done, but again, by my wonderful colleagues, they realized it's too invasive and it might take over and it, it's not going to be feasible, but we, we looked into it. And so things like that, that we're able to work together on something like this is, I, I, I think, again, um, a really meaningful experience. Um, the other thing that I did when I was researching some of the Atkins work is that, you know, as we know, all photographs are light sensitive to some degree especially cyanotypes, but um, more recent research has shown that if a, cyan that a cyanotype, if it loses some density as a result of exposure to light, um, that when put back in the dark, it actually can regain a lot of it back um, within a short amount of time, interestingly enough. Now, some experiments are still being done and there's still some debates out there, but I just love the idea that this Atkins print is like this living thing. 
um, that can kind of regenerate. I, I just, I think that, that excites me greatly. Um, so I'm so glad that we've been able to, to bring this into the, the Huntington's collection. And for the Aguilar work, um, I had been in touch with Laura Aguilar's estate when I was in my previous post at SFMOMA. And when I moved over to the Huntington, we kind of kept up the conversation and thought, this is a, a, a place also um, for, for Laura Aguilar's um, photography to find a home. And the estate's been working with several museums and institutions around the country to really advance her legacy. And so we really wanted to be able to work with um, such a, 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 a strong um, team <laughs> and a strong um, vision for where Laura's work um, could go. Um, her approach for photography explores a variety of themes, um, from lesbian and Chicana identity to interventions with the Western landscape, um, to the politics of marginalized groups, especially in Los Angeles. Um, and a lot of her works primarily made between the 1980s and 2008, um, portraits of herself, um, as you can see here, her nude body on the, on the bottom there, um, and including her friends, family, as well as LGBTQ and Latinx communities. Um, she was born in the San Gabriel Valley, um, a resident of Rosemead. These are all things that make sense also for why her work belongs at the Huntington. Um, and it was also a way to collaborate with my colleagues in the museum. Um, and we were able to come up with a selection of work that we could have both at the museum and the library. Um, this is another one that the museum was able to acquire um, in Sandy's room. Um, this is Laura was house sitting at a house that's actually only a couple of miles away from the Huntington, interestingly enough, and decided to pose in this kind of photolisk um, uh, uh, stance and, and gesture and in front of this open window as a kind of um, response to she had seen some beauty magazines that this person had lying around and wanted to think, uh, think about a different conception of female beauty. And what that could look like. And this is just this portrait was also included in a 2008 exhibition at the Huntington called The Side of Paradise. And so it's also kind of bringing this work home um, uh, back to the Huntington, which is also um, a really uh, wonderful connection. Um, but the material that we were able to get for the library um, was a some unique series that we felt again um, spoke to a lot of different aspects of our collection. This is a Day of the Dead um, series that Laura did um, from 1984 to 1982. Um, and a lot of these festivities were organized by self-help graphics. This particular one uh, was taken, um, these, this particular series, a lot of them were taken at the um, at annual um, Day of the Dead event at the Los Angeles Photography Center in 1989. Um, he actually constructed the coffin that you see there herself in the background, um, and it was a prop for the attendees to pose in front of. And many of them were part of this vibrant um, Chicano community uh, in Los Angeles, like Gary Gamboa, that you see on the left, um, and so we also have other significant um, photographs from the series where other families, couples in their um, domestic spaces also celebrated the Day of the Dead, but in a more intimate setting. Um, and so these are really, these are about families, these are about connections, these are about, um, and, and about, um, and about uh, LGBTQ um, communities and, and partnerships and, um, and kinship. So this is, this is, again, something that we really felt was important to bring um, to the Huntington and give voice to. Um, the last series that we were able to acquire to is the Plush Pony series. This was in 1992. Um, it's a Plush Pony is the name of a Chicana lesbian bar in El Sereno. And these portraits feature working class lesbians um, that are posed in front of this clock backdrop that uh, Laura put up um, in, the, in the bar. And it's just, it's a really, we have a series of six of these, but um, th this is a really a beautiful group of portraits as well as group portraits and individual portraits that convey this sense of community pride um, and camaraderie. Um, and what's interesting enough is that when we, when we um, announced the acquisition on social media, we used this image and we were already getting the messages like, that's my aunt on the left. I'm so proud of her. <laughs> um, so we're still discovering a lot of the identities of these people and I would love to be able to bring a lot of families and people who are photographs, um, who, the people who are in these in these pictures um, to Huntington to see the work in person um, and to really uh, um, find each other again that way. So um, that's also been a really uh, nice way to um, bring a new um, new interaction and new engagement with photography to the Huntington. So to close, again, it's been really rewarding to embark on this journey and discover a lot of new things. Um, but also grow the collection, um, hopefully in some dynamic ways um, in the years to come. So thanks.
Lindy, thank you so, so much. Um, it is so wonderful to be able to follow in your footsteps on this journey. And I also want to thank to everyone that has joined us tonight. I see that we have a lot of LACP members and in our Q&A, I see that we also have some members from the Huntington. So it's great to be able to have everyone here with us tonight. Um, and we also have a lot of questions. So, you know, I just want to, I'm thinking about all these photographic objects, how, you know, you presented that so beautifully, how they are written into the history of photography, both in words and in images. It was really, really clear from everything that you've shown us, anything from those incredible baseball cards. Yes. I mean, that <laughs> image of Ansel Adams is definitely going to um, go with me tonight. Um, um, and all the way into how photography is embedded into our daily environment. And here I'm, I'm thinking about those card games. And I, and I think, uh, I don't know how everybody else here experienced them, but it was as soon as you pulled them up and I saw that they were from 1940, yeah. um, um, definitely I'm going to be haunted by them tonight. So, you know, historically speaking, I think what comes across very clearly is how photography has always been crucial to how we tell ourselves the stories of our communities. And I thought that really came across beautifully um, in, in your work and, and how you're talking about that. So thank you for opening up those spaces for us. Um, and there's, 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 you know, you've mentioned how you talked beautifully about how you're working with the collection now and how you're reimagining it a little bit and diving into its materials. And there's, and there's something that I want to name in that context. And, get your take on, um, which is, you know, as curators that are working with collections and are working with archives and are researching archives, sometimes there's a deep need to reconcile or to bring in some of the histories that maybe were not previously told into A, the collection, and B, also to the gallery space where those histories meet the audience. And you, you, you were talking about researching the histories and making these histories available and collaborating with various communities and bringing new stories um, into the collection. And of course, we see a lot of, thankfully, contemporary museums that are now renegotiating their collections um, and bringing in stories that were marginalized in the past. I mean, the stories of Laura Aguilar and um, um, what she was creating in the local landscape we're not given enough exposure in the past. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about that, about the, and I see that there were also questions about that in the chat. Like, you know, you talked about how to bring that into the collection and how to work on the research. Maybe you can talk a little bit about how do you bring that to the audience? How do you bring those new narratives into the public space? Oh yeah, that's a, it's a great question. And thanks so much for, um, uh, pointing out so many different parts of what I'm I'm trying to grapple with, um, and I think with the Laura Aguilar work, I really you know I've been thinking about, as I said, I've been thinking about her work since I was at this moment, and and then thinking about how it could work at the Huntington, and what I realized is as a curator of the Crossroads collection, and as I was trying to find material that you know could connect with the work. There were so many things that we have yeah. an Edward Weston collection. We have, you know, we have so many different aspects of California landscape photography. But what's so, and I think that's what's so powerful about about her work is that it absolutely joins with all of those. But at the same time, it allows us to renegotiate those histories because she's thinking about them and certainly thinking about Weston and thinking about, you know, Judy Dater and you know a lot of you know she's working all of that in, and that's certainly. Um, a, a component of how she's making and processing work. But I think it's um, what I'm interested in is how we could maybe show there, how there's, you know, how there, it both complements those histories, but also pushes against them. And so some ways that I'm thinking about how to um, work with this new acquisition is, as I said, I would love to do more research on the people and who were who she photographed, and um, the state has luckily given me some of the model releases, so I'm able to mm. be able to um, to do more digging that way. Honestly, social media and Instagram have given me some 
connections to some of the family members, which is, I just think, you know, again, I, I just value that as a, as a resource um, and as a way we can um, sort of find people again. Um, so that's the sort of first step in terms of really trying to um, understand how really how these are made, um, who, you know, full context of how they were um, taken, who, and what was it like from the perspective of the people? You know, we have a lot of understanding of how Laura thought and worked based on the, of course, the people who are managing her, um, her estate and archive, but now I'm also interested in hearing what it was to be a, a, a person photographed by her. Um, so those are some of the things I'm, I'm thinking about. And then I would love in the future, and again, um, figuring out wh what form it could take, whether it is an exhibition, a smaller, um, you know, or like a smaller gallery rotation, the, the scope of it is still to be configured. But I would love just to think about what we have in the collection and how it relates to Laura's work and sort of putting Laura's work in context at the Huntington and <laughs> thinking about putting putting that work next to Weston's, putting that work next to um, you know, a, a walk in and seeing what happens, you know, and trying to sort of um, mix things around a little bit um, and even have maybe some historical documents from our California collections that can inform um, some of her some of her early connections to the San Gabriel Valley in terms of her, her own family histories. Um, so I think that there's a lot of ways, like you said, to make this public um, and, and to activate these photographs and to make meaning with these photographs in ways that I don't think has been necessarily done before and that we're more that we're capable of doing specifically based on what we have in the Huntington's collection already. Oh, that's fascinating. The way you're weaving in, you know, the capabilities and the histories of the Huntington with um, this remarkable work that definitely needs to get more attention, especially here, like of all places. Um, and if you're joining us from um, outside of LA, when I say here, I, I mean, <laughs> I mean, Los Angeles. <laughs> Yeah. Um, Shana is asking a very interesting question, and you you touched upon that a little bit. Um, you know, you you've been talking about um, collaborating with artists, and um, Shana was asking if you could discuss a little bit more the collaboration with your colleagues at your institution. You mentioned the beautiful collaboration around Anna Atkins, which again, I'm I'm shocked that it wasn't in the collection of the Huntington in the past, but. Thank you for being there, Lindy, and for bringing her <laughs> into the collection. Um, could you could you tell us a little bit about how it's like to collaborate with such an amazing cadre of resources and people around you? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Shana, for the question. Um, so she also uh, said hi, by the way. I, I know Shana, <laughs> my former colleague at the moment, wonderful, wonderful person. Um, so yes, what has been really great about working at Huntington again, I describe it as this hybrid place because. Um, while I'm the curator of photography, we have um, 13 other curators just in the library alone, um, as well as the, the curators in the museum. So um, they who all have a specific area of specialization, and it can be history of science, history of medicine, literary collections, um, you know, art, like as I mentioned before, California and Hispanic collections, um, Western history. So all of these. Um, you know, rare books, you know, all of these different areas uh, that, the, that Huntington originally collected has now kind of grown in our, our Pacific Rim collections, for example. So I've been, what has been so great about coming to the Huntington is I learned from my colleagues and how they're seeing, um, how, how they're seeing and interpreting history. Because I am so used to, um, I just, I can't help it. I, I learn through images. I just, it's just, <laughs> I'm an art historian. I'm, you know, trained that way, and then and, and photography has become, you know, a passion and a way for me to to really access and um, be able to make sense of history. And what's what's great is that I can then um, go to my colleagues and think about how they're interpreting manuscripts and letters and you know notebooks and correspondence and how they're making histories and narratives around those areas. And what's been great too about working with them when I started, they were like, well, now, oh, now you are a visual specialist. Now you can help us understand also the visual, you know? So we kind of, we help each other in a lot of ways, um, understand our work and our, our scholarship um, through our very specific kind of specializations. And so that's been really rewarding and, and eye-opening too. I've been able to already make a number of uh, shared acquisitions and on um, you know anything from um, albums of uh, you know road trips 
um, <laughs> through, through the West with my colleague, St. Peter Blodgett, um, who works in uh, Western American history, um, to looking at um, something like uh, Japanese American um, histories and um, materials with my colleague, Li Wei Yang, in the um, Pacific Rim Collection. He's an educator at Pacific Rim Collection. So things like that, they're constantly popping up where we work together on things all the time. And what's great about photography is it intersects with all of those things, you know? So like, Absolutely. The, that Bizog's, you know, card game, that connects in some ways to our history of medicine, trade, you know, when you think about facial types and, you know, and, you know, they're in the histories of, of you know, physio physiognomy, things like that. So there are ways that we can really come together on um, different aspects of the collection. But what I love is that photography finds its way <laughs> in it's all of everything. the discussions. <laughs> I mean, it's it's it brings up another question. You were showing us the postcards collection and you were talking about acquisitions of ephemera, which I think is another element that is a unique to the Huntington, but also unique to photography in and of itself, it's rare to find another area that can be collected in that way where, mm -hmm. you know, um, collections of postcards by private individuals or albums that were created by people for their domestic spaces suddenly find their way into photographic archives and institutions like the Huntington. Can you talk a little bit about the, um, meaning and impact of bringing ephemera and vernacular photography in this way into the collection? Yeah, that's, you know, that's part, part of why I, when I was talking about the train exhibition, why I wanted to focus on the vernacular part of that, because, um, you know, that was, a, a, I think, a, a, a good step for us at MoMA to collect vernacular photography and us at MoMA, yeah. which is, you know, a, a, a modern art museum. Um, to bring in vernacular photographs. In, in, in that sense, they were collected by an artist, and that's maybe, and he made an installation. So there is a, a sort of an extra yeah. step there. Um, but I think in general, in the photography community, there's, a, of course, wide ranging scholarship on vernacular photography and how it, it is, is part of, um, you know, not only the histories of photography, but now as part of art institutions, part of libraries, part of, I mean, New York Public Library and their, their collection, you know. So, it's certainly um, it, it's certainly part of the history that is not something we you know we can ignore anymore. I mean, it's just, it's just part of what we need to look at. These images are they mean something. They you know that they they traveled, they circulated, they people held them. They are part of family histories, and they have stories that are part of the history of photography, but also part of other histories that we need to 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 reconstruct. And so. Um, I think what is interesting, we do have at the Huntington a lot of things like family albums, um, mm -hmm. people that um, put together um, different, you know, uh, arrangements of things. And so even thinking about how how sequences of photographs were put together, vernacular photographs were put together by an individual is interesting to me. It tells a new Absolutely. kind of dimension um, to how that photograph, uh, what that photograph meant at that time. Um, and so I think there are a myriad of ways to be able to um, to both collect vernacular photography as well as interpret it for the collection. And it is great that we already have so much. I mean, we have scrapbooks, for example. Oh my God, don't get me started on the scrapbooks. There are so many scrapbooks. I want to see the scrapbooks, Mindy. <laughs> I mean, remarkable in terms of just how, how they're constructed, what they tell about different um, aspects of visual culture. Um, and not to mention, you know, specifically California culture. Um, but I feel like it's this is a whole area of scholarship that is has been has been going going. But I feel like there's even more strength um, added to it because because people, because institutions like us can collect it and yeah. researchers can use it for various purposes. So. Absolutely, and it sounds like you're also bringing that um, strategic way of thinking into projects like Laura Aguilar. Like the way you were just talking about that also resonates with how you were discussing, you know, how would you present that to the world? And I think it's wonderful to be able to have that context, that fuller um, historical context and the visual culture context within the gallery setting. So I, I, I really appreciate how you bringing those themes into the gallery setting. Yeah, um, in that context, Mary's also asking if you're, um, if there's a collection strategy in place around acquisition of archives and if the Huntington ever considers 
um, collecting archives of photography, commercial photography studios as well? Yeah, that's a great question. We do have um, certain archives, um, specifically commercial photographers from earlier um, uh, in the 20th century or mid, mid 20th century, like Maynard Parker, um, Dick Whittington. Those are some uh, two big collections that we have of um, commercial photographers' archives. Um, we're still discussing our basically our capabilities as well as um, uh, mission fit in terms of collecting contemporary photographers or even later photographers, like mm -hmm. um, later 20th century photographers' archives, whether that's suited for us at the Huntington or if other institutions might be more, you know, like it's CCP or perhaps even Stanford or, you know, places that focus very much more on um, especially artists, photographers, archives. Um, so that's still up for discussion for sure. And I think a lot of it depends for me on, um, it depends on how, like I said, with, for example, Laura Aguilar's work, um, it depends on, on how it talks to the rest of the collection too. It's not like we have a blanket statement of, oh, we don't take um, artist archives or we don't take photographers or things. That's not true. I think it really depends on what it is and how it, um, how it connects to what we already have or how it might expand our thinking about what we may want to do with um, thinking about uh, what we want to do with the collection moving forward. Um, I'm actually still in the process of, of putting together a collection development plan um, because, again, I've still only been here for less than a year. So. Time. It's okay. We're it's letting good. you have it. It's fine. <laughs> um, but that is a question that I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about. Um, and storage is also always an issue. So, you know, just in terms of, in terms storage. of space and that kind of thing too. So I'm yes. taking all that into account as, as these come up, but a lot of times we get, we, we get queries and we sort of take them one piece at a time and think about it. You know, as these come in, these questions come in, let's, let's look at the inventory. Let's look at what it is. Let's think about, oh, does this, does this work with this? Can, can a researcher get something from this? Can we, can this bring something to this, the legacy of this person in, in a way that, you know, can really find strength at the Huntington. So these are just some of the questions we ask, but um, it is, it's kind of a case to case to case basis. That brings to mind another thing that you were talking about tonight that I want to make note of because I think it's important for all the photographers that are in the audience to hear this. Um, studio visits, how crucial are they and how we as curators need to have those studio visits and need to be out there because that changes the experience completely when you get to be there in that workspace with the artist and to have that back and forth with them and sometimes new things come out of that experience both for you and also for the artist um yeah so to make it all that you you spoke about that beautifully and you shared the studio visits with us and i think it's always important for photographers to hear this that curators want to have studio visits yeah. They want to be out there and meet you, right? Like it's important to like not all photographers are aware of that, I think. Oh yeah. No, it's it's essential in my mind. I mean I've said it since the beginning of when I started to to, to get into curating because um there is just no other way you can understand a work unless you are really in the space where the work is being conceived and really um developed. And you know sometimes it really is just also being in a more relaxed space and feeling more, sure. um, feeling like you can just have a conversation with artists. It doesn't feel, you know, that you can just explore together. You can ask questions and together. And, and those are things that I think um, really just get me excited about, you know, what is being made and how, how people are thinking. Um, and what they're experimenting with, what they're failing at even, you know, I mean, I think that's important too, is like being able to see work that maybe isn't going to turn into anything, but that's okay. Like it, it still shows me something about um, what an artist is trying. And that also opens up another pathway. To Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's crucial. And it really, it's a beginning of a conversation that you never know where is it going to end if it's going to end like which is which is part of the fun that's what makes it so so unique yeah. um i have this incredible question from tabitha for you um if you could recommend the work of one contemporary woman identifying photographer from the philippines who would it be 
must be alive, Tabitha. <laughs> Will be. you take the challenge? <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah. Um, no, it's not funny. I just, the way it's phrased is great. Um, well, there are, gosh, that's a, that's a great question. I mean, I guess I, I can't help it, but I, I already mentioned it in my part. I just, I am a huge Stephanie Sukupo fan in terms of just, I mean, and Stephanie was born in the Philippines and then um, did come, come here with her family. And so, um, you know, I, I just, I'm constantly in awe of how she thinks and, and is, um, and is developing her practice. Um, what she's reading, what she's, um, and how she's becoming more informed every day by the archive, I find um, constantly exciting. And, um, you know, that is someone that I really, uh, you know, I really um, want to continue to work with in some form, whether it's at the Huntington or, uh, you know, even just, you know, um, other, other projects. Um, but uh, so that's someone that I, I feel really too. That's fantastic. And I hope that everybody wrote it down and Googled and you, you actually brought to us tonight so many incredible names of artists. Um, it was so inspiring to be able to um, get your take on these works and on these histories and these people and to see how you're bringing them into the Huntington. Um, I think it's fascinating to see how things are evolving and changing. You know, you mentioned decolonizing practices the ability to destabilize histories and recontextualize them and think about them in a new light is so exciting. And I can't wait to see where that would lead you in, in the next few years. Um, so thank you for being so open about your work and for sharing all of this with us tonight. We're so happy that we got to experience that with you. Oh, happy to share it. Happy to show some of the journey that I'm, that I'm on right now. So thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you so much. And